so I want to welcome, welcome all of you. I also especially want to welcome uh, and thank all the people who uh, helped to organize this. So this uh, entire initiative um, came uh, by three uh, co-conveners of which two are here. So uh, Mario Santana and Haifa Abu Halim are here. And then there is also Christina Cameron. And I wish also to thank uh, all the rapporteurs of technical support and all the anchors uh, and the moderators and all the attendees who are here and our panelists and main speakers to be here for this uh, for this event, which is uh, very nice. Oh, Marcel Grossler is also joining. Yeah, and, and of course, we also want to thank all our wonderful sponsors who are highlighted here on the screen. Mm -hmm. If you wish to uh, um, present yourself into the main, into the chat, please do so. If you want to put your name and, uh, and uh, where you are from, uh, you're welcome to do so. Uh, I think, uh, Michelle, we can start um, with the next slide. And I think, Mario, it will be the first to actually introduce the entire event to all of you as one of the co-conveners. Mario, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kay. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So do, do not forget to record the session. I think we are recording. It's already being recorded. From ah, excellent. So <clears throat> thank you very much for giving me the floor to, to welcome all of you. And you know, let's thank our anchors for session 2A and 2B and also our moderator panelists and participants and our techie and also our rapporteurs. So on behalf of the steering panel of our World Heritage, I would like to welcome you to the second of, or let's say the first of 12 month debates of World Heritage issues that will be held throughout 2021. And our second activity after the first activity we just had in Asian uh, time zone. Our World Heritage is a public initiative primarily aimed at developing a stronger role for civil society in World Heritage conservation efforts. Through this year of debates, we intend to develop a number of proposals for the enhancement of the World Heritage System in 2022 to mark the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention. The 2021 debate aims to raise general awareness about critical threats that natural and cultural world heritage sites are encountering for increasing development pressures, industrial and mining operations, climate change, unsustainable tourism and conflicts, among others, and to develop opportunities for the involvement of civil society in finding sustainable solutions. Our goal is to involve a large group of professionals, NGOs, institutions, and citizens engaged in heritage protection, conservation, and management and to organize a permanent network of civil society that is able to provide the public with an independent assessment of the situation at war heritage sites. From the beginning of the initiative has given priority to working with cultural and natural heritage places in all regions of the world and across generations. So far, our war heritage has held a successful virtual launch in November, 2022, moderated by the dynamic international journalist, Zainab Badawi. If you haven't seen it, you can go to our website and link on the video. <clears throat> January's debate on the transformational impacts of information technology has basically two goals. The first is to build a robust global network of organizations, professionals, and individuals interested in the topic. And the second is to discuss ideas on how to enhance the use of information technology to monitor our world heritage sites and present multiple narratives through various tools of interpretation. The participation of over 700 people from around the world on this webinar shows that the network is strong, thanks to the tireless efforts of our co-conveners, Haifa Dulahim, myself, and the many members of our team. So we invite you, each of you, to get involved today and in all other activities and debates this year. I, we look forward to hearing from your ideas and hope that you enjoy the webinar. So let me go back to you, Asilis and Kay, and wishing you all the best for this session. Great. Thanks, Mario, for this wonderful message. Over 700 participants by now, I think. So on the next slide, uh, we want to shortly introduce you to the global competition. So Kay, take it away. I, uh, I, I give the, the floor to Hirsun actually to do this, who did this in the previous session. <laughs> Hirsun, can you say something very briefly about the competition? 
Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Kay, for giving me the floor. Yes. Um, taking this opportunity, uh, we'd like to make uh, just one announcement. Uh, our team is launching a global competition to highlight the transformational use of technology that increases community engagement in monitoring, interpretation, and presentation of World Heritage Sites. Uh, the two main objectives of this competition are uh, to strengthen the monitoring of World Heritage Sites using information technology. The second is that uh, to enhance multiple narratives in the interpretation and presentation of heritage sites, uh, also using the information technology. Uh, this competition is therefore designed to celebrate uh, innovative approaches to fostering engagement in heritage properties with a special focus on a project grounded in the need and the visions of a local community who cares for the site. So we invite you to be part of this competition. Uh, for this, we encourage you to submit your letters of intention by the 29th of January, 2021. So for more information, uh, please visit this website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Yasing. So everyone who is out there, if you have a great project that you want to share with the world, just go ahead and check the website. There is wonderful mentoring and prizes um, to be won. Great. So now we go uh, to the next slide where we have a, a short recap of what our wonderful colleagues have been uh, in the very first session of our Globinar. So uh, Dive, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. And uh, uh, once again, it's a pleasure to be back in session uh, two now. We had a very, very successful, energetic, and enthusiastic session one, where we had discussed several aspects uh, over the last uh, almost six hours. Uh, we had four panel discussions on monitoring, interpretation, nature culture link, as well as intangible uh, heritage. Uh, there were mainly debates on the four basic questions on the tools, challenges, uh, the learnings and replicability and innovations in the uh, role of digital technologies in transforming our world heritage. So without going into much details, uh, on, in all the four sessions, these were the common concerns. The first being that technology is but a proxy. It's a tool which we need to use, but that should not overpower the heritage. The second the most important aspect that came across and it, it cut across all the rooms and discussion was need for connections and cooperations. Uh, so that they could be an integrated interdisciplinary approach. Now these connections uh, were, um, could be on several uh, level because our team was mainly bridging the digital divide. Now these divides are not only physical, like I mentioned in session one, but they are also intellectual as well as perspe perspective or perceptional, perceptional divides. So they need, we need to create bridges through policy, engaging professionals and academias, uh, because there was one uh, thought that several of the technologies that we use uh, in, in interpretation uh, are at times uh, are experimental or are, are developed as prototype. And so I think to build up more comfort level, we need to create more robust policies and dialogue among professionals and academia. The other bridge that was uh, required to build is between aspects or interrelated aspect of uh, cultural heritage because heritage per se needs to be seen more composite. And there's, there was a discussion that there exists a digital disparity uh, between the way we look at our cultural heritage or we look at natural heritage, and finally the way we look at intangible. So the, uh, the kind of investment and uh, support that is on the cultural side is uh, not there as much. It was felt in the discussion on, on our natural heritage. 
and less so in the intangible. So there was a, a need felt that the practices of IUCN, ICOMOS, and the intangible cultural heritage convention uh, are required to be connected so that there could be learnings uh, from each other. Uh, important recommendation that has come out of our session is the need if for I, a hand I, 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 Sorry, you, you, have, you have one, one minute left. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. so there was a need for hand-holding template which could guide the appropriate technologies for specific aspects or looking at monitoring or indicator of the OUV. And then the other thing that was discussed was about the innovative affordability and accessible technologies where low and high-tech technologies could be uh, combined for better community engagement. There was a lot of discussion about data security, risk, uh, because for which I think there was a discussion that we don't have enough standards and a lot of data that is captured is at risk. And in the interpretation, continuing with the multiple narrative, the alternative possibilities was also discussed. And uh, the limitation of technology of for auto micro monitoring was also discussed. And they said it was discussed, we need to develop more technologies for scaling this aspect in which even users uh, could be involved. And lastly, the caution to go slow experience so that the virtual do not swap the real ever. So thank you once again. And we hope that the same discussions and more fruitful discussions will come out of session two as well, like Definitely. from session one. Thank you. Thank you Thanks very much, Thanks a lot, Divai. Yeah. Divai uh, Diva is also co-chair for this entire uh, webinar. So I would want to thank you for all of the work uh, having done so far. So this is great. <clears throat> Next. Slide. <laughs> Next. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so thank you everyone uh, for being his, here and joining us in session 2A. We are all about co-creating opportunities and um, technology across borders. Uh, we just want to very short um, g give you a view on what we're doing here today. So everywhere across the globe, we can see that the digital revolution is literally changing the ways in we work, in which people know, understand, use and visit World Heritage, World Heritage uh, sites. What we aim for today is understanding if this digital revolution is also taking place in the day-to-day -day reality of World Heritage sites among local community managers, individuals, NGOs, organizations. Um, and how can World Heritage sites actually take advantage of this historical transformation? And then finally, a key point that you will see reoccurring throughout all discussions today is what are the tools and techniques that we can use? What are challenges and opportunities in applying these new tools and techniques on World Heritage sites? And how can we actually replicate best practices from around the world? So this is a, a very short introduction to give you an idea as to what we will all be discussing together today. And then we move forward to setting the tone um, of our session 2A. And to actually do this, uh, next slide, we have invited uh, four participants. Uh, so our very first uh, participant that we would like to welcome today um, is Teresa. Teresa, if you're here, uh, you can give us a shout. <laughs> um, so Teresa is an architect from Portugal, and she has a master's degree from the Ramon Lemaire International Center for Conservation and a PhD in engineering science on the conservation of archaeological sites from the University um, of Leuven in Belgium where she also has been a visiting professor since 2004. Currently, she has a private office in Brussels that offers both public and private clients expertise in a wide range of projects and activities, including the conservation of monuments and archaeological sites. Um, Teresa basically has a very active track record in many countries, particularly in the Mediterranean basin. So she has been working in Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Algeria, and so on. And she has been working as a consultant with several international and EU institutions, such as UNESCO. 
Um, following many, many years of active work in different ICOMOS groups, she is now the new president of um, ICOMOS International. Okay. Yeah. Um, so another uh, main speaker of this event is Tim Badman. Tim Badman is the director of, the, of IUCN's Nature Culture Initiative and the director of IUCN's World Heritage Program. Um, he has been senior IUCN spokesman on World Heritage uh, and chair of the IUCN World Heritage Panel and head of IUCN's delegation at World Heritage Committee meetings since 2007. Um, he's working closely in developing uh, uh, links between nature and culture sections, which is a, a large part of this, uh, of this initiative to, to talk about these things, including through the World Heritage Leadership Program jointly run by ICROM and IUCN with support from Norway. Um, this is basically the main, the main uh, Points. Uh, back to you, um, Azalis. Ah, no, Monir is also for me. <laughs> and uh, Monir uh, Bukchenaki is also here. He was born uh, in November in uh, 1943 in Algeria and contributes during four years to the launch of UNESCO uh, Category 2 Center in Bahrain, the uh, Arab Regional Center for World Heritage in Bahrain, in Manama. He was elected Director General of ICRAM uh, 2005 to 2011 and the initiator of ICRAM Sharjah Center uh, in the UAE. Um, after that, there was a long career in UNESCO where he was Assistant Director General for Culture, Director of the Division of Cultural Heritage and Director of the World Heritage Center at UNESCO uh, and in Algeria, Director of Antiquities, Museums and Historic Monuments uh, from 1970 to 1981. He holds a PhD in Archaeology and Ancient History and has been awarded titles of Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres, Officier des Arts et des Lettres, and Commandit de, des Arts et des Lettres. Um, and presently, he is now a special advisor to the UNESCO Director General and to ICROM Director General. Thank you very much. Over back to you, Azlis. Yeah, thank you very much, Gay. So for you today, we don't just have these three wonderful speakers. We also have a fourth panelist with us today. Uh, Stephen Battle. Um, he's an architect with um, over 30 years of professional experience in managing conservation projects in Africa, the Middle East and Asia. He started his professional career um, in Zanzibar, where he worked on different projects uh, in the historic stone town. Then from the late 90s to 2008, he worked for the Aga Khan Trust um, for culture based in Geneva where he was managing several um, urban rehabilitation projects for uh, Syria, Tanzania, and Pakistan. And in 2009, uh, he joined the World Monuments Fund, um, where he has been the program director for all projects of WMF um, in Africa. Um, he has led major multi-year conservation projects in a wide range of countries, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Sierra Leone, Mali, Ghana, Burkina Faso, Maldives, and many, many more. Um, and between 2017 and, and 2020, um, he, done, uh, he has done several projects in Jordan and Lebanon uh, to train Syrian refugees. So this was, uh, for, for all of you, uh, a very short introduction to the main speakers today, who will set the tone of the discussions uh, that we will have later on. So for each of our uh, panelists, uh, welcome and thank you, thank you very much for being here. Uh, we would like to now ask you uh, a first question. Uh, so Michelle, if you can kindly move to the next slide, super. Um, so the first question that we would like to ask uh, to all of you is basically in your own uh, professional experience and experience in the international organizations that you work, can you see or have you observed a difference in how information technology is actually being implemented um, and used in different World Heritage sites? With difference, we mean, is there a difference in geographically in what areas you can see more or less use of information technology? Also typologically, are there some sites, for instance, nature or culture, where it is more difficult to, to use information technologies or certain um, documentation techniques? Or is it also something to do with availability of tools, skills, and resources? Um, so I think um, we will start with asking the question to Teresa, as she was the first um, on our list. So Teresa, um, can you give us a, a short um, indication 
on, on your perspective? Yes, thank you very much, Azilis. Yes, absolutely. Um, are you listening to me well? Yes, yes. 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 Okay. Perfect. Absolutely. There are areas where the use of information technology is perhaps more common. Um, we know that there are a, a growing number of information technology applications in cultural heritage, uh, but there is still a wide disparity in how uh, uh, information technology is being used in world heritage sites around the globe. And the reasons, of course, for this disparity are of a very varied nature. It is true that there are areas where the use of information is more common, like, for instance, for a specific historical building, especially if these historical buildings are in an urban context. It's also many times used for, and I'm thinking on archaeological sites, especially <coughs> archaeological parks, where we have many interpreting examples, uh, uh, especially in Europe, but a little bit all over the world also. Or for instance, uh, we are using very much for inventories and digitalization of certain historical urban areas and its buffer zones. So information technology is also very, been very much used for the monitoring, especially for risk assessment. And this has been very much developed lately, um, especially for the World Heritage sites that are more exposed uh, to threats. But of course, in general, these sites are situated in areas with more easy access uh, to specific tools and infrastructures. Um, areas uh, where the offer of a specific skills and resources is higher. And it's clear that um, today there is a gulf between those who have ready access to computers and to internet and those who do not have. But um, for us in e-commerce, it's fundamental um, building communication networks for sites. So safeguarding information, creating databases, helping site, uh, site employees, administrators and managers, um, giving the possibility to visitors also to understand and to learn about the site. And for that, e-commerce is engaging in a few projects um, and that I'd like to share with you. I don't know if you have the slides. Yeah, the picture we have that, some uh, slides for that here, um, yeah. Michelle. Um, one of the projects that I'd like to share with you is Heritage on the Edge. That is a project that one, we are doing. Sorry. <laughs> go, go ahead. No um, that we are doing in cooperation with CIARC. Uh, it's a project and Google Arts and Culture. It's a, a project where we present five world heritage sites. It's a kind of a small sample of cultural sites affected by climate change. I really invite you to look because there is, it's very interesting the way uh, that uh, e-commerce is presenting these sites. And this is a kind of an approach also uh, all over the world. We have sites in uh, the five continents. We have also another virtual tour, another project very interesting that is a virtual tour. It's what we call the Anchor Project. Is that one? Yeah. Um, the, the Anchor project is a web platform provided by Carlton Immersive uh, Media Studio. It's a joint initiative of e-commerce, SciArc and uh, Yale University. And it's a project in response to the catastrophe loss of cultural heritage in the Middle East. Um, and the project, in fact, aims to create accurate 3D recording of heritage uh, sites uh, yeah. at risk. Okay. So, uh, information technology can be uh, can become really for us an opportunity to help managing world heritage sites, uh, to monitoring them, and to engage, of course, audiences and present multiple uh, narratives, as you told, uh, through various tools of uh, interpretation. And this, in this sense, e-commerce is very much concerned ensuring the usefulness of information technologies for cultural heritage conservation, but also, and this for us is also very important for education and dissemination of information. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Azilis. Yeah, thank you very much, Teresa. Uh, I really like the idea of uh, ICOMOS building information technology networks, definitely something that will reoccur uh, in our talks later on. Uh, we would like to pose the same question also um, to Tim Bateman, who is here to uh, represent uh, IUCN. Do you see any disparities in the use of information technology across the globe on World Heritage sites? 
So thanks, thanks very much. I hope you can hear me. Uh, maybe yes. I could first just say thanks for the invitation and congratulations on this uh, the webinar and more widely on the launch of our, our, our World Heritage. It's really uh, an overdue and brilliant initiative. Uh, and let me also congratulate Teresa on her uh, recent election to be president of ICOMOS and say also say what a pleasure it is to be on a panel with Munir, my dear friend Munir, and to be working again with my dear old friend uh, Haifa. Um, on the question, um, so firstly, maybe just by way of background, we've circulated the, the links, I think you see them on the screen, of the IUCN World Heritage Outlook, which is our global monitoring effort for natural World Heritage sites. Um, and, you, and it's just been updated and, and uh, the third edition launched uh, in just in December of last year. And, I, and I'm not sure we know the answer in a very deep way to the question about the use and disparities in technology, but it's, it's really an, an important issue. But I do think that it's clear, even from looking at the basics in the World Heritage System, that there are very big disparities. One, one thing I might pick on is, you know, just the basic knowledge of where World Heritage sites are located through having good electronic boundaries that can enable us to use technology for monitoring. So having, uh, you know, having good good um, GIS, uh, Ge geographical information system operable boundaries. And that information is basically not available in the World Heritage System. And very few um, nominations seem to present that. So we've had to create that layer for natural World Heritage sites. And I think that's such a basic level of knowledge that's needed. Um, it tells you something about the degree to which we still need to work on some of the basics of um, you know the, uh, the the knowledge base for world heritage areas, but I, I wanted to otherwise answer the question a little bit um, diagonally and and just note a few issues that I think are important in in addressing and moving forward with technology. So one I think is beyond monitoring is in the, in the application of technology to dealing with threats to world heritage sites and in terms of learning from what is working, I wanted to draw attention to um, one of the experiences there's been um, looking at monitoring tools for handling poaching. So there's been a very interesting initiative um, with a number of NGO partners um, working not only in World Heritage Sites, but through a technology called SMART, um, which is addressed specifically to addressing poaching threats, which is such a big part of the threats to natural World Heritage Sites. But I think it's a very good example of a tool that's addressed to a key threat to World Heritage Sites, where there's been effort with IUCN and also I think even more with the UNESCO World Heritage Center to, to roll that technology out across World Heritage Sites in some of the geographies where these issues of digital access and digital divide would be a problem. So there's been lots of good solutions there to learn from. Um, I think mm -hmm. the, second, uh, uh, the second issue I'd like to flag is the opportunities to work with remote sensing, which we really don't take uh, adequately in the World Heritage System. We've been trying to build those technologies um, into the work um, in the World Heritage Outlook, but there's still lots of ways in which geographical information systems, satellite um, sourced information uh, and automated ways to provide that information to managers could be provided and it isn't at the moment. Um, we did some work through um, brilliant colleague Ishwan Shi to develop some prototypes um, for applying um, that, that remote sensing information to, to natural world heritage sites. And again, it would be interesting to build on those. Um, a third point is to look, I think, specifically at climate. Uh, and I think Teresa mentioned this as well, um, where, you know, I, I think a really good question is how we can bring uh, international climate science and climate knowledge to site level um, through, through technology. There are a lot of uh, tools, projections, uh, models that can be um, put in the hands of managers to better manage uh, incoming climate threats. And that's really something where there's a lot of great work going on both in ICOMOS, IUCN yeah. and with a number of our partners to build on. And the last is I think I'm really delighted to see that our World Heritage is flagging uh, technology in the use of um, presentation of, of World Heritage sites. Um, I think it was said in the introduction that, you know, there's a feeling that culture sites could, could have more access to some of the tools in, in the nature sector. But I think in the nature sector, this is one area where we really have huge amount to learn from the culture sector. We're way behind in terms of presenting sites, I think in general. Um, but there are, I, to my knowledge, lots of examples of really good site level practice. But uh, the issue that I wanted to raise were two issues. One, one is the degree to which COVID um, is gonna lead us to need to do much more remote presentation of World Heritage Sites. Um, you know, as, as an alternative and an option in terms of access. And lastly, an issue that I rail about a lot as an English Anglophone is how can we use technology to really empower many more languages um, in the World Heritage System? And presentation is a good place to start with that because we have a system that's uh, 
works through my mother tongue and the mother tongue of all the francophones on this uh, call um, exclusively when we work for World Heritage and we really need to be much more embracing of so many more languages. So thanks very much for the chance yeah. to speak and there are a few thoughts. Yeah, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, you already raised several interesting points, such as uh, automation of certain things and the crossovers between culture and nature. We will uh, get back to that soon. Um, now I'm going to ask very shortly uh, to Munir uh, to ask the same question, because we still have a second question lined up for the both of you. Uh, so Munir, uh, can you shortly, um, in your own experience, did you see any disparities as to um, how technology is being used across the globe? Yes, thank you, Lee. Uh, first of all, let me just thank you for this very, very important initiative, uh, Globinar, and also to give us uh, the, this opportunity to be with colleagues uh, such as uh, Cristina Cameron, uh, uh, Patricia, uh, Teresa Patricio, and uh, uh, also all uh, colleagues. Uh, yesterday, I was also in contact with uh, my friend uh, Dive Gupta for another video conference. And as I said in the beginning to Kay, uh, I think because of COVID, maybe this kind of uh, uh, technology that now is widely used is uh, giving a, an additional support uh, in our field, in the field of cultural heritage. But in order to reply to your question, I want to say that uh, from the beginning, we, we see, uh, particularly from my own experience at UNESCO and ICROM, that uh, there is a, a difference uh, geographically of the use of digital technologies. And uh, it is uh, clear that uh, the region which has already advanced a, a number of uh, uh, tools uh, for uh, the documentation, the mapping, uh, the, the link uh, between the different sites is uh, mainly in Europe and uh, I, you know, I can inform you that there is, uh, you know, uh, a declaration that has been signed by 27 European countries uh, about uh, cooperation on advancing digitization of cultural heritage. Of course, we don't have a, a similar situation, fortunate, unfortunately, in Africa, where we know that a number of countries have not all the tools or the technology available on, on, on site. And I think the, the aim of this kind of meeting, the, this glo uh, global uh, meeting that you are organizing is a way to uh, raise awareness about the uh, uh, technologies that are missing in some parts of the world. And also uh, I have seen, because this is a Creole experience, that if we had, uh, you know, uh, had made uh, a 3D um, mapping of sites uh, like uh, in Syria, uh, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, where uh, in Mali, where unfortunately the war created a terrible destruction of World Heritage Site. We were not speaking about only World Heritage in general, but also World Heritage Site have suffered. We know now that we, we have a, a, a lack of uh, information and documentation. And uh, now we have to take a lesson about this. So uh, we, we need to, uh, first of all, recommend from, uh, with our colleagues from ECOMOS, and I, I, I use this opportunity to, uh, you know, uh, give my greetings to the new president of ECOMOS. Uh, we, in UNESCO, you know, I was always saying that we have uh, two hands, you know, IUCN for the nat natural heritage and ECOMOS for the cultural heritage. I think that these two organizations having such a, a, a wide network in the world can uh, be very helpful for the, the lack of digital uh, technology in, uh, in, in, in areas, large areas, not only countries, mm -hmm. in Africa, in uh, North Africa and the Middle East, and also in some uh, countries of Central Asia. So this is the, the, the first point. The second point is I think that uh, we can already see some initiatives coming actually uh, for uh, cultural heritage. And we, I would like to show in the, the screen uh, a new initiative uh, which was born only recently in uh, 2019 
uh, with the, uh, a meeting of President of the Republic of five countries in the north of Mediterranean area and five countries in the south of Mediterranean, and it's called in French Conservatoire du Patrimoine en Méditerranée. The aim of this COPAM, this conservatoire, is, is to see at the level of these 10 countries, north and south, more than 200 properties inscribed on the World Heritage List, and some also which are currently on the tentative list, to, to start uh, doing a very important work of documentation, of uh, information uh, exchange, uh, because I think this would, ha would have an, an important impact, as it was said by my predecessors, in the field of management and follow-up of, of this uh, World Heritage Site. The second example that we have used with the, uh, this new uh, startup, which is called Econem, with uh, the very bright architect Yves Ubelman, is to even in the sites which are already badly damaged, and here you see uh, the picture of the arch in, in Palmyra, that we can use this uh, advanced technology uh, to prepare for a proper rehabilitation and restoration of, of these sites. Uh, I, I would like to say that uh, for UNESCO, this is a, a very important point, and uh, I, I consider that uh, we should continue to work uh, on this, uh, on this uh, area because now we have to benefit from this uh, technology. I was very much impressed when I visited once uh, uh, the site of Olympia in, in Greece, how the advanced technology is, presented, is, is presenting in the museum of Olympia, how, was, how were the game of uh, Olympics uh, during antiquity, and this is very important for the young population. You know, this, young, this technology is more accessible to the young generation. I want to con con conclude in saying that when I was archaeologist and I was in, you know, trained in photogrammetry in the 70s and the 80s, for us it was a kind of revolution because we didn't use anymore the uh, theodolite and the and the you know the mapping of archaeological sites and monuments and that this was a kind yeah. of a new system today yeah. with all the tools that we have i think that we are going to make a great progress in the preservation and the management of world heritage sites Thank you very much, uh, Munir, for this uh, already elaborated view and, and a lot of examples. Uh, I picked up on a lot of points that we'll come back later on. Uh, finally, I would like to give the floor to uh, Stephen Battle. Uh, can you give us some insight based on your uh, experiences um, as to the discrepancy in use of information technology? Sure. So um, thank you, Azalees. Thank you, everybody, for uh, um, inviting me to this presentation. And thanks for everybody for taking part. Uh, greetings to colleagues. Um, so, um, so discrepancies. Munir mentioned um, Africa. Um, most of my work is in Africa. Um, and I mean, I think it's important to just stress that there are, uh, are that people are using digital tools uh, in in Africa. Um, on the slide and on the next one, uh, Azalees um, is an example from Kutamaku in Benin, where we're working with a small uh, NGO, Beninoise NGO, um, and the Ecole Patrimoine Africain. Uh, to do uh, an inventory and mapping. And they're using Cobra Collect, just loaded onto tablets and, and doing it very, very effectively. So there are, I mean, digital tools are used in, in Africa. Uh, are they used as much? No, but I think it's important to stress that the problem is resources as ever. If there were more resources, it would be used as widely as anywhere. And I can say this with certainty because anyone who has spent any time uh, in an African university knows that they are full, full of smart, tech savvy, curious people. And that's what it takes to use digital technology. Um, 
and Africa has such people in abundance. So the issue, the issue is, 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 is resource. And the other important thing to, to talk about, to say about Africa, of course, is that it has leapfrogged the analog period. It's gone straight from, uh, straight to the digital era. And so people there are much more comfortable using digital technologies than perhaps they are in, in the Europe. Uh, so, but look, I think I, 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 I want to just, uh, and forgive me for this, Azalise, because I think I want to blow this, this thing up a little bit, if I may. And, sure. and so the focus is very much on world heritage, and, that, and that's fine. But um, I think the view from the NGO world is that the real opportunity that digital heritage, sorry, digital technologies presents is outside of the world heritage system. Um, and I think Africa is a case in point. You've only got to look at Tanzania, for instance, where there are over 200 ethnicities, Ethiopia, where there are over 70 ethnicities. Each one of these groups has its own material and intangible heritage. But this heritage is disappearing at an incredibly rapid rate in sub-Saharan Africa. As people move to cities, the old folk uh, pass away, etc. It's certainly a risk. Digital heritage, uh, sorry, digital technology can further blur the distinctions, but it also creates a great opportunity to democratize our the valorization, the recording, and the preservation of cultural heritage. And for me, this is the great opportunity. Uh, world heritage, of course, uh, critically important, no argument at all. But I, I, I would, I would request, I would ask, I would beg that as a, as a, as a sector, as a field, as a group of colleagues, that we look beyond the world heritage system to that that wider, finer grain of heritage, and ask ourselves how can we assist civil society organizations who are, will be the key to preserving that finer grain of heritage? How can we assist them, put tools in their hands to record and preserve their own cultural heritage? For me, that is the great opportunity. That's also the great question and the great challenge that we as heritage professionals have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, for also raising this super uh, important issue. Interpretation and, and civil society are definitely part of the, what we need to discuss today. Uh, then I would like to give the floor to, to Kay um, to continue with our setting the tone. Thank you very much for these already very interesting discussions and very interesting points that came up. Um, we had another question. Um, but I, I, I'm, depending on what you just said, uh, I, I would like to slightly um, modify this to one of the points that are there in the, uh, not the question itself, but in the, in the small post is under it, which is, and it also combines to the question that Mario just asked in the chat box, which is, um, is uh, we can talk about device and we can talk about challenges, we can talk about uh, differences, but let's talk about, uh, things that actually merge, things that bind, things that, that come together, and where are the, 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 the points that uh, there are uh, possibilities to move forward uh, on both, both nature and cultural sites, and where can technology uh, enhance such a bridge? So one possibility, for example, and I would ask every panelist, um, every uh, main speaker to, to wrap up in one minute what you think about what are the possibilities for platforms to merge these things, for example, nature culture monitoring tools that can be across the board, or to ensure that the technology can be uh, available and accessible to all, but also sustainable. I think sustainability of, of uh, data, sustainability of platforms is very important, and sustainability of, uh, of these, uh, of these uh, issues. So I would like to give every uh, main speaker just one minute as we have to wrap up afterwards uh, relatively briefly, um, one or two minutes to just uh, quickly give a comment on these things, uh, opportunities, innovative ideas, and, uh, and possibilities. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, I'll start with you. Uh, yes, um, it's, a it's very interesting that you put this, uh, this subject on the table. Of course, it's, I think it's the most, uh, perhaps the most challenging one, because um, I think uh, it's uh, it's um, when we think in in 
nature cultural sites and especially the, the sites with large, are normally sites with large dimension, of course, becomes much more difficult to, to, um, to apply the comprehensive information technologies in a, in a, as you told, in a sustainable way. Because sometimes we are, we have, uh, we are more normally working in areas that is not only a question of having social, economical, and cultural uh, differences, but I think it's also a question of a general approach. Um, sometimes we, we face areas where there are uh, fear of technology, or sometimes even an absence of a motivation or a, a missing of objectives. And as Tim just made the reference, even the simple question of a problem of languages. How can we share information and use some, some information technologies that will be understandable uh, by all of us? Because we, we cannot think that is uh, only one or two languages that solve this problem. So for me, this is, is something that is, I'm very concerned with. And, um, and I, I really think that we need perhaps to it, well, this is the reason we are here today, of course. We need to engage, perhaps, as Munir told, more young adult, adults, because they have a lot, much more skills to that, and to prove that uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, emerging professionals of e-commerce working here with us today. But I really think that it's important to, to establish strategies. We need, perhaps, better understanding uh, of how current systems are being used in World Heritage Sites, who is using them, how they function, and, uh, uh, and um, what are the, 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 the future research needs on the field itself. And this, well, today it's of course a very important and a very interesting discussion because this can help us perhaps to define the, these questions. And on, I think only with these, we will be able to address sustainable recommendations how to, to use information technology. Thank you very, very much, Teresa. That was very informative. And um, I, I'd like to pick up on that by saying that in the uh, breakout rooms after the uh, main panel, there'll be a lot of people showing some of this cutting edge technique also in fields that it's not being used so often yet. For example, as Tim also mentioned, uh, satellite, uh, very detailed, very advanced satellite imagery, which can be used for both culture and nature sites. And to try and merge all these top technologies between the fields and put people together uh, and, and learn from each other. I think it's a very, very nice point and the communication helps a lot. Thank you very much for this. Tim, uh, your opinion on this in, in a very brief uh, uh, setting. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Well, to be very brief, I think to answer the question about opportunity, I think, I think there's huge opportunity to um, move forward in these areas. And I think we're actually in a very good, good position because um, we've, we've really now got quite a deep um, and ag an agreed approach to, to join up wherever we can and learn from each other wherever we, we can between the nature and culture sectors. So you mentioned at the front of the, um, the, the this session the World Heritage Leadership Program where ICOMOS and the World Heritage Centre are also very involved with us. The Connecting Practice uh, Program that ICOMOS is now uh, coordinating looking at uh, joint and trans uh, interdisciplinary working. Um, so I think there's a culture, if I can put it that way, that uh, that's shifted inside um, our work on world heritage to be capable of bringing um, nature culture approaches together. And I, in my earlier answer, which was uh, much longer than this one, will be, you know, I flagged some of the, the areas we could be working on together. Uh, you know, climate climate vulnerability is uh, an, ob an obvious one, perhaps amongst those. Um, and um, I, I think we're also, I mean, our World Heritage is coming at a very good time to bring part of what really is needed in the World Heritage system, which is links to external partners. You know, the capacity of ICOMOS, um, of IUCN, of ICROM, of the World Heritage Center, you know, we all have different ways in which that's very limited. And, and you know, World Heritage requires many, many more people to be engaged. So our World Heritage can help us um, make those connections. Um, but lastly, it's important that we have much more voice from the ground level, from site managers, from communities, from the constituencies that can serve places on the ground about what they really need. Uh, and again, we've been able to open up uh, lots more space for site managers inside the World Heritage System. But I think you know this globinar and those you know those wider approaches can really help us do that. Um, lastly, can I just really agree strongly with the need for a logic for world heritage that extends beyond world heritage? Um, you know, for IUCN, you know, world heritage, 
you know, it's a, it's a means for itself to conserve old heritage sites, but it has to be a means to inspire wider conservation practice. Uh, and in fact, the Nature Culture Connection is one place where it can be really on the leading edge of new paradigms and new ways of working. You know, this is the really exciting uh, opportunity. But, you know, World Heritage on its own only gets us in a very limited world and it's been far too inward looking for too too much uh, time so the much you know the more we can do to see a logic of how world heritage contributes to that bigger practice you know how it can be um you know demonstrating what the best looks like uh, i think uh, the, the the better um so let's please uh, do that too thanks very much uh, and um thanks for this opportunity to join you today thanks a lot tim that's a very very important point and thanks a lot for also showing the uh, the uh Outlook assessment tool of IUCN, which I think is a very comprehensive tool and which can uh, which can be very useful uh, and uh, which was recently updated in its third third version. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to give the floor to Monir, but I would like to remind of the time we, because at 12 exactly we would start moving to the breakout rooms and there are still a few things that we would like to do before. Um, so, Monir, in one minute, what is your opinion about culture, nature, uh, uh, bridges, gaps, uh, and about opportunities, yes. innovatives? Yes, go ahead. Yes, very quickly, because I, I, I certainly agree, first of all, with my colleague from the uh, World Monument Fund uh, about uh, uh, what is happening, of course, in Africa, and the link between the Convention of 72 and the Convention of 2003 about uh, intangible cultural heritage. The second point is very important. It is already in the Convention of 72. It's not, we, we shouldn't be addressing only uh, the world heritage in, a, and giving the impression of what is not on the world heritage list, either cultural or natural, is not important. On the contrary, I think the world cultural heritage is, is an engine for the rest of the, of, of the heritage. And finally, I, I want to show you one example of the link between culture and nature and the use of the new technology in a site where we, we are working since more than 30 years in Angkor, in Cambodia, the use of the LIDAR, the use of the up-to-date technology for the uh, uh, mapping and, and, and it was showing that we are not limiting the work only to cultural sites, but we are working now with specialists of forest, specialists of nature, because this work is always interdependent. It's, we cannot uh, look at it only from one simple angle. This is exactly, it's a very good wrap up. Thank you very much, Munir. <laughs> it's, 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 it's very uh, well, well put. Uh, Stephen, what is your final uh, takeaway? My final takeaway, thank you very briefly, um, change. Change, change is the thing which is the greatest, all of our greatest enemy. And it's that, those small little incremental changes that happen um, all the time, which are very, very hard to see. And what, if, what uh, digital technology, information tech, sorry, digital heritage, um, digital platforms, information technology, what that able, enables us to do is to broaden, increase the number of eyes that are looking. At, and, and track change in a different way. And I think that that is, 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 is a potentially a hugely important tool. Um, I think of the recent collapse of the House of Wonders in Zanzibar, which I'm sure all mm -hmm. of you are aware of. Uh, now, and, th and that, is, that was an incremental process. Um, if there was a way of, of tracking those small changes, which then lead to a catastrophic collapse, then I think it would be much easier for us to uh, um, jump in and do something about it earlier on. So it's it's the multiple eyes, really important. The other important thing I'd say is that it's a way also of, of increasing and, and frankly changing the, the narratives that are associated with cultural heritage sites. And I'm, I'm thinking here of the uh, potential for, for people associated with from a culture of custodians associated with heritage sites to record narratives his story and her story associated with those sites and these narratives these voices currently are rarely um, listened to rarely heard and I think there's a huge potential there with with information technology and digital 
uh, tools to, to record more narratives, more no voices. And I think this can have a transformational effect on our sector. Thank, Thank you, you very Stephen. much. Thank you very much, Stephen. This is extremely interesting. Um, so I like how you talk about little cracks in the system. And this is definitely something we work on in, in detail in, in, uh, in nature as we try to predict uh, stuff like climate change effect mm. and, and, and things as extinction. But it's very interesting that we've now learned the vulnerability of such systems with very small things, such as a little virus that can completely disrupt economies and which perhaps has shown more sensitivity and vulnerability of World Heritage sites and the, and the tools needed to, to monitor things in time. So thank you very much for this. Um, we will continue these discussions in the breakout rooms for those who uh, can stay. For those who cannot stay anymore, uh, Tim uh, is leaving um, and uh, I think Munir also could not stay. So I'm very, very grateful <clears throat> to you for this highly interesting discussion. Thank you very much for um, for this interaction. And um, Azalee, if you have a short takeaway, otherwise we move forward to the next uh, practical points to move to the breakout rooms and we can yeah. Thank you very much again for all of you. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank, for thank to all of you happen. for being here. It was great. Thanks, Munir. Thanks very much, everyone. Enjoy yeah. the rest Thanks, of the event. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Michelle, can you... Um, go ahead on the slides please um so basically uh, we will go to the breakout rooms in two minutes um we had some interactive polls uh, ready for you guys for everyone who is here but we will start them after the breakout rooms because we really would like to um try to set the timing um, let's let's do a very quick poll um yeah you want to do it now okay yeah i think it would be cool <laughs> yeah so uh joe if you could uh, could you pull up um the poll and uh, there's a there's half a minute per, per poll for people to quickly uh, interact and answer questions. Yeah. So, yes, Joe, let me share my screen. Yeah. yeah. Actually, so good. I, I'm a bit too, too much time managing, I guess. So, it's a cool idea. So, Joe will now share his screen. And, and what the poll does is basically you will be able to see very clearly who is with us here today. Um, so, it kind of gives you a, a good uh, stakeout of you, of who you will be talking with and who is giving their input. So, this is kind of Please. a good call, okay? Okay. So, enter the link we pasted in the chat so you can uh, enter from which you know. Yeah. So, which. So, your, are Joe, your, uh, your, mic your microphone is off. So, there is a yeah. link in the chat. If you <laughs> click on this, uh, all of you, you have half a minute maximum to fill this in, and I will do it also. Yeah. So basically, here we see appearing um, different sites uh, where all of you guys, all of our, how many are we? 115 participants have been working. Um, so it's starting to look uh, very international. I we'll, like we will give 15 more seconds, and we will stop it. Yeah. I see a lot of wadis, it's also cool. A lot of ruins, that's maybe, okay, okay. We can dig that, wadis and ruins. Venice somehow is, <laughs> is a huge thing. Historic, Bahrain. As yeah. well, yeah. Cool. But it's changing all the time, so it's really nice. So 10 seconds left. What is Dil Dilmun? Guild, Harbor, Malaysia, churches, mountain, a fort, great. Yeah, fear is there. Testimony. I like it. Whoever did the testimony, love it. Okay, now we, we can close this one and then we go to the next one. So this one is there. Uh, so where are all of you guys from? So if you can uh, fill out that poll. Okay, luck is represented. Oh, wow. Europe, North America is definitely there. Okay. Mm-hmm. Keeps going, okay. I, I was hoping to say, oh, we're quite a well-balanced group. So again, we can see there is some difference when it comes to uh, the use of information technology so far. Um, okay, 10 more seconds and then we go to the next one. I like these polls. <laughs> <laughs> do we do it before the breakout, K or after? Uh, one more before the breakout. It's just so, so much fun. And then here we start this. For those who are not following, Kay is a super fan of live polls. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Um, okay, we close this one. So most of our people here are from Europe and North America. Oh, yeah. so but we have representation from every region. So I'm kind of really happy about it. So and the next one is asking you, what is your 
level of yeah your affiliation exactly. Now we have wow background music. I'm hoping that's you, Joe or Mario. Oh, okay. oh it's not me. <laughs> A lot of uh, academia going on, but also, well, there is some civil society, uh, could be nicer to more, but okay, it's growing. Government also NGOs are well represented, I do like it, independent experts, private sector, civil society keeps growing, this is a good sign. Cool. Okay, so let's okay. say the amount of academia, but we are overall well represented, so we will have maybe some contradicting views, which is always good. Uh, we're doing a discussion. I like it.